Let's pray. Our loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us see, let us hear, let us know what it means to respond to your word this day. Amen. Well, when I was a child and me and my siblings were offering up our endless requests to my mother, fancy holidays perhaps, cool new sneakers, these new things at the time called Nintendos, my mum would often answer with, when our boat comes in. Do you remember this expression, when our boat comes in? You can have that thing when our boat comes in. Many years later, as an adult, my eldest brother confessed to my mum that his entire childhood he thought there was a real boat (laughs) travelling somewhere around the world full of our wealth and treasure that we were waiting for, coming at some point to arrive wherever we lived and transform our lives, suddenly we would be rich. He had been waiting all his childhood, waiting and waiting for this boat, always coming, but never arrived. Just six weeks in to the first COVID lockdown, if you can remember back in 2020, I turned 40 and it was a birthday I'd been really looking forward to. I'd planned big parties and celebrations. And having no family in Queensland, my brother and sister-in-law sent me a very kind and loving package from Tennessee in the USA to help me somehow celebrate my special birthday as we all entered into this new reality called a pandemic. The package that they'd sent, so there was a number of items in there, very specially thought out for me, had tracking. And you probably know the phenomena of tracking your package as it comes from somewhere. But you probably also remember we had a lot of postage problems in that first six months. Remember this? So we had this tracking number and we both, them there and me here, would follow this tracking slowly for many, many months as we watched this parcel travel around the globe getting updated every couple of months until it finally arrived in a Brisbane dock after 11 months, presumably at sea, only to suddenly and inexplicably be sent back to Tennessee where it arrived after 16 months, returned to sender. I never did receive that package. Have you ever been at a restaurant with a group of friends and you've all ordered your meal and you're sitting around waiting and one by one the meals arrive and it might be you or somebody else in the group whose meal just never arrives and you're waiting patiently and then eventually you get to the point where you realise, oh, I think that order got lost and it's not coming. That's happened to some of you, yes. We all know something about waiting for something that doesn't arrive. And sometimes they're little things, trivial, like a meal, that can easily be reordered and sure everyone's finished eating, but it's not that big of an inconvenience. But sometimes that waiting is for big, important things, things that really mattered to the shape of our life or what we thought our future was going to look like. And we know something about that feeling of waiting for that thing that doesn't arrive. As we come to the end of this series on Revelation, finally to chapter 22, we're confronted with this very scenario. A prophet and a community waiting and expecting Jesus to arrive or return any day now. And then, within, I guess, a few centuries, that community realising, oh, that's not what's happening here. As the single revelation given to John comes to its conclusion, chapter 22 presents its final sequence of imagery and promise. And this is what we hear. Verse 7, you just heard it. See, I am coming soon. Verse 10, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. And verse 20, the one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. In wrapping up or concluding this unravelling revelation that Jesus has given to John, the final message presented here is Jesus is coming soon. 
That's the thing repeated throughout the chapter. And we know from the writings of the New Testament and all the other early church textual materials and the practices of the early Christian communities, we know that they believed the return of Jesus was imminent any day now. But here we are, 2,000 years later. So what are we to make of these holy texts? As we bring this series to a close, I want to stay with this claim, Jesus is coming soon, because it is the primary message that comes out of this closure of Revelation. But I want to unpack for us some of the ways that it has been understood in the space of theology and faith after those early first centuries, when the Christian community gathered and said, okay, that's not what's happening. Maybe we are supposed to understand this in a slightly different way. And by staying in that space, it helps us, I think, make sense of the entire book of Revelation, everything that we've been covering over these weeks. And it's this, scholars and people of faith since those early centuries have come to, I guess, reframe that idea into what might seem like a confusing or perhaps even paradoxical claim that Jesus is always coming soon. That's the kind of theological claim that emerges out of this reckoning with the Jesus who didn't arrive in those early centuries, that Jesus is always coming soon. Yes, John expected that soon to be in the coming years, probably in his lifetime, like all of the early church. But actually, and you'll recall this from what we've covered over these weeks, the book of Revelation had already sown the I would say, theological or philosophical seeds for us to understand this claim that Jesus is always coming soon. You might remember in our first week and second week, both Peter and I talked about the way time and space is compacted or compressed, if you like, into this heavenly view so that time is operating as both a a history of things that have happened in time as we know it in that linear fashion, but also in the event of God's salvation, the eternal time, if you like. God's saving acts, both a history and an instance. This is what the symbolism and all the apocalyptic imagery is all about, pointing to Christ as the saviour, but also pointing to the completion of, of God's perfect salvation. So one of the ways we talked about that, you'll remember, across some of the weeks is the use of the number seven, the symbolic imagery of the number seven in the book of Revelation, this number that comes from a heavenly view, the idea of a perfected, completed revelation. So even as we now await, these works are already completed in Christ. Does that make sense? We, we often use the language of the kingdom that both is both here and not yet. It's both of those things. Jesus is always coming soon. So it was already there in the text of Revelation for us to understand it this way, to make sense of time and space in God's eternity. Jesus is always coming soon. He's not in that ambulance, by the way. But he's always coming soon. So what might that mean for us today as a waiting and confessing community? I just want to share a few of the ways this theological claim has been framed. The first is Jesus is always coming soon in the face of the other. For many scholars, and certainly those thinking about the everyday elements of life or the existential part of what it means to be a human, Part of understanding this idea of Jesus is always coming soon is embracing the coming of Jesus in the face of the stranger. Jesus is always coming soon around the corner in that face you're yet to see. And I'm sure many of you have heard this kind of teaching that comes up in perhaps the story of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. What you have done for the least of these, you've done for me. Jesus is always coming soon in the face of the other or the stranger. And in the context of Revelation 22, this calls us out 
of looking at the clouds for an escape route or passively waiting for some magically different world to appear. It calls us into a relationship with those around us and into our time and history. This is the moment for you to encounter the Jesus who is always coming soon in the face of that stranger who you may struggle to look in the eye. Jesus is always coming soon in the face of the other and we have to decide what we're going to do about that as individuals and as a community. But Jesus is always, also always coming soon in the redemption of all creation. Go back to that text that Ian started reading out for us and picture that river of life, bright as crystal, flowing through a city of gold, as we're told elsewhere, making its way through and across a tree that contains the fruit of knowledge and a fruit of every kind that will sustain all sorts of people and the, providing the healing of nations in the leaves. This is a picture as we end, end the book of Revelation, a picture of what redemption looks like, this healing and sustenance. After the horrors of the apocalyptic imagery, some of it quite horrific, as we know, that's been strewn throughout the book of Revelation, we come to this final image, and it is sublime. As it says in Romans, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together as it suffers in the pains of labour, waiting for this day, waiting for this picture, this picture of God's redemption and healing of all creation. To say that Jesus is always coming soon in the redemption of all creation is to choose faith over wild, anxious and almost always dangerous speculation. And we've seen across many different religions, including Christianity, over the last two to three hundred years, this kind of resurgence of an obsession with end times and making weird speculations. But I want to suggest to you, this is almost at odds. I might probably say it is at odds with the life of faith. This is not what God has called us to. We've been called to the way of faith. And so we hear these words of revelation given to John. Jesus is always coming soon in the redemption of all creation. And we are invited to be servants of that redemption and that healing of all creation as we wait and choose faith. But above all, if we're going, you know, above all of the any other ways I could describe this, Jesus is always coming soon in the glorification of God. Every confusing and symbolic and complex use of Jewish signification or apocalyptic motives that have been used throughout the book of Revelation and that we've unpacked over these weeks have been building to this point of conclusion. This is it. If you want to hear anything, this is it, friends. Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, the one promise, the one whose life brought salvation. And when he returns, make no mistake, he will sit upon the throne in God's holy city. He will be glorified. This is the sound of trumpets. My friends, it's the blinding light of eternity touching earth. This is the moment that you would feel tempted to take off your sandals and lay prostrate because you are on holy ground. And let's be clear, the meaning of glorification isn't what happened to Courtney Vine last night after she kicked that final penalty. It's not extreme admiration or veneration, as excited as we were. Glorification isn't human. Theolo theology has never understood glorification to be a human thing. It's not something you or I can do. We cannot glorify God alone. Only the Father can glorify the Son. And in Christian theology, the glorification of Christ is the final act, the final moment in that whole story of redemption, 
the lamb upon the throne, the divine full stop. This is why the great religious artists have gone to such lengths to signify glory, the gloria, through a crescendo, perhaps. Or the blinding use of light in a fresco. A lyrical sequence that takes your breath away. So imagine again, friends, that holy city made of gold. And in the middle, that throne from which a river of light, bright as crystal, flows. And in that throne sits Jesus, bathed in the glory of the eternal. Jesus is always coming soon as the glorification of God. Greg's going to help us reflect on that just for a couple of moments. Thank you, Greg. Friends, Jesus is coming soon, and together we say, Amen. Amen.